Hello, welcome to lecture seven. So this week we're going to talk about unemployment and in particular we're going to talk about a specific set of models that try to explain unemployment which are popular today in the macroeconomic literature and these are called search and matching models. And so we're going to see a little bit more about how these fit into sort of the history of macro first. Um, so what we've done so far. So we've discussed the history of macro, we've looked at business cycle facts, and then most recently we built a micro-founded, one-period, new classical model. That's what we did for the past two weeks. And this allowed us to analyze two things. One was consumption decisions, and the other was labor markets. And recall that in the model we looked at, in this new classical model, there is no unemployment. Right? So we have business cycle fluctuations, but wages adjust in such a way that the labor market is always in equilibrium and labor supply is equal to labor demand. And so as a result, there's no unemployment. Now, of course, uh, this is not true in reality. I mean, in reality, there is unemployment, probably almost constantly, and the level of this unemployment fluctuates uh, significantly. So what gives? Well, so I'm going to talk about a few views here on unemployment. So the first is what we've seen. This is what I just mentioned. So this is the new classical view. That is, it's the, the view that we saw in our new classical model. Um, and it also really just goes back to the marginalists, these people who developed microeconomics in the 1800s. And as I said, uh, what's key here is that you have a sort of well-behaved labor market, an upward sloping labor supply curve, a downward sloping labor demand curve, and if you're ever temporarily out of equilibrium, the wage will adjust to bring us to a point where labor demand is equal to labor supply. So just to remind you, so labor demand is downward sloping, as we saw, because the wage is equal to the marginal product of labor. And we assume that as the amount of labor employed by firms increases, the marginal product falls. And so we get this downward sloping labor demand curve, which really just says, as I lower the wage, there will be a higher demand for labor, all else equal. And so this is one of the reasons why this labor market clears, is that as the wage falls, firms demand more and more labor up until the point where we have this equilibrium again and there's no longer unemployment. Okay, and I said this already, obviously there is unemployment, and so how do we explain this? So I'll talk about first the sort of three types of unemployment that we talk about in the literature, okay? So we can kind of categorize unemployment into different causes. So one is cyclical, and this is maybe the most obvious one. So this says that unemployment is caused by movements in the business cycle, okay? I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. The other two uh, we'll talk about in more detail today, and these are structural and frictional. So structural unemployment says the following. There's unemployment because there's a mismatch in the supply and demand for skills. So in other words, there are some workers who have skills, but they're not the right skills that are being demanded by firms. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. And then there's frictional. And this is sort of our main focus today, which is that unemployment is caused by workers searching for employment. I can't find a job immediately. I have to search for a while, and while I search, I'm unemployed. And kind of key here is that different theories tend to stress these, you know, one or a few of these different types of unemployment. I'll be clear about that in a second. Cyclical unemployment. So I said this already, some unemployment is undoubtedly the result of the business cycle, right? When times are good, demand is high and lots of people are employed. But in a recession, times are bad and a lot of people lose their jobs. I mean, this is kind of what you might expect. And just as a brief note here, recognize that in the model we looked at, in our new classical model, we did have these movements in the business cycle, but there's still no unemployment. And the reason is that the wage was always adjusting to bring us back to a situation in which labor supply is equal to labor demand and there is no unemployment. So what kinds of assumptions do we need to have sort of cyclical unemployment? 
And I'm going to talk about these sort of two Keynesian views very briefly. I'm going to talk about these because these were kind of what were popular in, you know, post-World War II, up until the 70s. So, and well, the other perhaps popular now as well. But this first one, so this is Keynes's view. Keynes said that the labor demand function isn't downward sloping. Okay, it's a perfectly straight line like this. And why is that? It's because what determines labor demand is the demand for goods and services. Okay, so I have this here, sorry. Firms hire the number of workers they need to meet aggregate demand. That's what determines the demand for labor. Decreases or increases in the wage don't really have an effect. So why is that? Well, imagine that there's a decrease in the wage and suddenly firms see that the marginal product of labor is now greater than the wage. Okay, the amount of stuff they can produce is now greater than what they have to give to the worker to produce it. So the, the marginalist or the new classical view would be, okay, well then the firm will increase its demand for labor. But Keynes would say, no, it doesn't matter, right? Even though I can produce more than I have to pay to the worker to produce it, what matters is it whether or not anyone's willing to buy it. I mean, I can produce it, but if there's no demand for it, I'm not going to, right? It'll just sit in a warehouse somewhere if I produce it, and it's really no good to me. And so in this sense, changes in the wage will not bring about an increase in labor demand. And so as a result, you don't have this wage clearing the market. You don't have the wage changing to get rid of this unemployment. This one, the new Keynesian view, this is kind of more popular today. Um, and it says, oh, and in fact, you'll see this later in the course. It says, yeah, okay, the labor market does look kind of like what the new classical is talked about. So you have this downward sloping labor demand curve, an upward sloping labor supply curve. The problem is that the wage just doesn't adjust quickly. So imagine you have a shock to labor demand like this for whatever reason, maybe a shock to productivity. It causes labor demand to fall, okay? But the wage can't adjust quickly for various reasons, or alternatively, prices cannot adjust quickly. And as a result, the wage can't fall, or the real wage can't fall, such that the labor market is once again in equilibrium. And this is what causes unemployment. So this is the new Keynesian view. And like I said, you'll see this again later in the course. What about structural unemployment? So remember I said this is about workers having one set of skills and firms needing another set. And you could say, okay, well, why don't those, fir or those workers acquire the appropriate skills? And the reason could be perhaps it's too costly for them, or perhaps it just takes time to acquire those skills. And so maybe over time they will, but you know, for the time being, they don't have them. And so as an example, you can think of the sudden loss of jobs of non-college educated workers in manufacturing. So because of whatever reason you might talk about, so we could think of increases in productivity, robots, or, or increases in international trade, suddenly a bunch of people working in manufacturing lost their jobs. And those people had a certain set of skills, those appropriate for manufacturing, but those skills might not be useful for other types of jobs. I don't know, computer programmer, uh, accounting, I have no idea. You know, they have a certain set of skills, but they're not the skills being demanded in the workplace. And so either they can retrain, which takes time, or alternatively, maybe they don't retrain at all. It's just not worth it. And I put this in. This is from the Globe and Mail. Um, and it's a, I'll read you the headline. It says, Canada has a skills shortage. And then, but what skills and where? Lack of data leaves the experts unsure. I put this in because I, um, before starting my PhD, I worked on Parliament Hill. I was an analyst with the... Um, with the Finance Committee, the House of Commons Finance Committee. And every year business groups would come and say, oh, the problem is, you know, you gotta help us, we have this skills shortage. And that's, you know, that's really the problem right now. And we need to find ways to train more people so that they have the appropriate skills that we need. And 
I put this headline, I thought it was funny because often uh, this is correct that they say, oh, we have this skill shortage, but it was never clear what skills they needed or how to attain them. But in any case, I put this mostly because I want to say that this is a, an explanation for unemployment that you see a lot. Finally, frictional unemployment. And this is, like I said, the one that we're mainly going to be dealing with today. Okay, and this comes from the following, that finding jobs takes time. Okay, so job finding is a costly or a time-consuming activity, both for workers and for firms, right? Firms are working, or firms are looking for workers, and workers are looking for firms. And so if I'm a worker looking for a firm, for example, I have to go look in uh, wanted ads or on uh, indeed.com, you know, the whole process for job search, and I can't get hired immediately, you know? And so the fact that I can't get hired immediately, that I can't find a job immediately as soon as I want one, is referred to as search friction. And so these search and matching models um, famously are developed, I mean, they were developed by many people, but the most famous people are Peter Diamond, Dale Mortensen, and Christopher Pisarides, who won the Nobel Prize in 2010 for this. And as I said, these are gonna be the models that we study today. These models developed by these three and others, um, which, as I said, are referred to as search and matching models. Um, and so here's a little bit of history for you. Now, no doubt all three causes we talked about are causes of unemployment. There's undoubtedly a cyclical component. There's undoubtedly a structural component in that there's a mismatch of skills. And there's also undoubtedly this search friction component that obviously I can't get a job as soon as I want one. I have to look. And since looking takes time, during that time I'll be unemployed. But emphasis has been placed on different causes at different times. Okay, so some theories tend to place an emphasis on one rather than the other. So as we saw, for example, Keynesian theories tend to place an emphasis on the cyclical component. Changes in unemployment have to do with movements over the business cycle. They're being caused by changes in labor demand and this inability for the market to clear, okay? And so this view, like I said, was dominant until about the 1970s. And post-1970, there is this political movement away from big government. I mentioned this in one of my past lectures. You know, around this time, you have people like Ronald Reagan in the United States or Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and you have these sort of conservative movements that are moving away from this idea of big government. And Keynesianism, Keynesians were seen as sort of supporters of big government. And why is that? Because, you know, Keynesians traditionally said, unemployment is a problem that government can fix. And how does it do that? By spending more, by increasing the size of government. That's sort of the traditional view, right? The government has an important role to play in the economy. And so when there was this movement towards conservatism politically, you tended to see similar movements in economics, okay? Movements away from Keynesianism that was associated with this big government. And this was also the time of the development of search and matching models, okay? And these partly replaced Keynesian models of unemployment. And we're gonna see, I'll tell you, in, well, in the next slide, and then later when we look at the models, that you know, there are obvious reasons for this, or that is there are reasons that kind of go along with the political movements that were going on then. I mean, these models tended to explain unemployment as being about search. You know, it wasn't that there was some problem with the market, it was just a natural outcome of, obviously in a, in a capitalist economy where we have a market-based economy, obviously it takes time to search. So it's not a problem that the government needs to step in and fix, it's just a natural outcome of how the market works, right? It's, that's what unemployment is. And so I have two kind of quotes here to help make my point, that this was really, in some respects, a reaction against Keynesianism. So the first is from Dale Mortensen, who I mentioned on a previous slide, one of these guys who won the Nobel Prize for these ideas in 2010. <clears throat> and so he says, in the early 1970s, Keynesian thought dominated the profession's view of unemployment. That was what I said earlier. The idea that workers might rationally choose to be unemployed was beyond their imagination. 
Indeed, when I presented a working paper version of what became my AER article at the annual meeting of the American Economics Association, some who attended walked out in protest. So notice this phrase here, unemployment, or uh, the idea that workers might rationally choose to be unemployed was beyond their imagination. Why is it rational? Again, because I'm rationally choosing to be unemployed while I search for a job. It's not something wrong with the market that government needs to step in and fix. It's just a rational outcome of people searching and searching taking time. Likewise, Christopher Pissaridis, another one of these Nobel Prize winning economists who helped develop this, this is from his Nobel Prize lecture. He says, this approach to search has the advantage that it makes unemployment neither voluntary nor or involuntary, concepts that caused a lot of confusion and fruitless debate in the literature. Unemployment is instead the outcome of a decentralized equilibrium, which may or may not be optimal. So again, they're kind of downplaying this Keynesian idea that unemployment is a problem that the government has to come in and fix. No, it's just the result of a decentralized equilibrium and it's very possible that it could be optimal. I mean, optimally, some people have to be searching for jobs. 